This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. So, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker uh, this afternoon, uh, Professor Dr. Claire Kemmers at uh, the Goethe University in Frankfurt, where she is the Lichtenberg uh, Professor of, uh, uh, oh, I'm blanking on the full title. Um, Maybe it's called numismatics. <laughs> of numismatics. I think it's something like monetary history in the Greco Roman world or something like that. Um, uh, but, and uh, she's a specialist in Roman coinage and especially coins in context, excavation coins, and works a lot on iconography as well. And uh, she's really one of the great pioneers in uh, kind of the um, uh, the concept of audience targeting on Roman coinage, uh, where in particular, um, she's uncovered a lot of evidence for um, iconographically differentiated supplies on imperial coinage. So um, you can read this, for example, in her book, Coins for a Legion, about the uh, excavation coins from Nijmegen that showed certain kinds of images being deliberately targeted at the military population there. And of course, she's gone on to publish on a number of subjects since then. Uh, and recently, she has a small book with Brill um, called The Function and Use of Roman Coinage uh, that surveys recent developments over the past couple of decades in the field, uh, in the field of Roman coinage. Uh, and if you were here a little early, you heard uh, Flair and Peter talking about uh, the next International Numismatic Congress, and of course she is organizing that um, as it will be held in Frankfurt in 2027, is that right? Okay, so with that, uh, I'll hand it over to Claire. Okay, thank you, Nathan, for introducing me, and thank you for inviting me to do this round table in which what's your afternoon and my early evening. Um, I've prepared, um, a small presentation and I'm very happy to take on questions afterwards of course uh, Emma told me that it's probably a bit inconvenient to have questions in between in the zoom format so please save them for for the end um, and I'll stop sharing my screen uh, and then launch into the into the talk okay can someone just give me a heads up that this is okay yeah all right good um all right, there we go. Um, so as Nathan mentioned, one of my research foci is iconography and especially looking at how the Roman state kind of uh, uh, use iconography on, on Roman coins to communicate with its inhabitants. And today I'm going to flip the coin around a bit, so to say, um, because today what I'm going to look at is not necessarily what the Roman state is doing with these images, but whether these images actually end up with an audience. Are people actually realizing what's on these coins and are they kind of understanding the messages that are being sent out by the state? Um, so is there any interaction with the iconography the Roman state goes to so much trouble to kind of communicate to its subjects? Um, so um, the way I've structured this is that I'll start with, well, how to possibly answer this question. Uh, what kind of sources could we consult and what exactly is it that I'm trying to, to find evidence for? Um, and then after setting that out or what I think would be appropriate uh, methods uh, or sources to use, um, I'll talk a bit about what evidence is there that pe people were actually taking notice of images and texts on coins, that's one point. And the next is then, can we see them kind of moving beyond looking at them and perceiving them, but really appropriating in the sense that understanding the message and kind of reworking that into something for themselves. And what I mean by that, I'll, I'll come to that in a, in a minute. Um, okay, so um, of course I could stop this talk with talking about Roman imperial coin iconography in general. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to kind of jump right uh, in the middle, um, which means that for this talk, 
I take it for granted, or as a, as a starting point, that Roman imperial authorities used coins as a medium for political messages. And there is a whole lot being written about that, and some people agree more or less. Um, but for now, for today, we'll, we'll just take that as a starting point. Um, and that these coins were kind of, these, these messages were uh, targeted, Nathan already mentioned that in the introduction, um, that specific messages were targeted for specific metals of specific denominations, so gold, silver, or small change, uh, big money, that sometimes there's the same message, well, so either there is different messages on different metals or denominations, or the same message but rendered in different ways, depending on the gold, silver, or, or copper, so maybe more elaborate or um, abstract messages on, on high value coinage and more kind of uh, right in your face messages on, on the small change. Um, and that on occasion, these messages were also supplied to specific target groups. So specifically for soldiers or the population in Rome or um, audiences in the provinces. Um, I'm happy to talk about that later on, but for now that's that's a given. So to say. Um, and as I said, I'd like to flip the coin around and ask, um, <laughs> did they, people actually pay attention to all of this? Um, I mean, the, the Roman Empire was huge. Um, the, the, the population was en enormously diverse uh, from Britain in the north to Egypt or Syria in, in, in the southeast um, and everything in between. Um, did people actually pay attention? And all people? in the sense from, you know, peasants until the aristocracy in Rome, and how can we tell? And um, this is a, a message that's, or an, an image that's often used to actually show, or one of the very few images that shows people actually examining coins. It's supposed to be a, a tax paying scene or a rent paying scene. It's from a funerary altar uh, from Belgic Gaul. And here you see um, Belgic Gauls, they have their sp very specific uh, capes on with little uh, hoodies, hooded capes, hooded sweaters, so to say, um, and they're actually handling coins and looking at them. And are they just looking at them to see whether they're genuine or might they actually be paying attention to the images? Um, paying attention is one thing, but that they then actually understand what they were seeing. I mean, looking at a picture is something different from actually understanding what you see. Did they recognize emperors? Did they recognize the various gods and goddesses or the various personifications? And again, um, just an educated elite or, or everyone. Um, and actually the, the, the most difficult question maybe of all, um, the Roman state, as I just mentioned, puts quite a lot of effort in quite elaborate messaging. Um, but were these messages actually understood? Is it just sending? you know, sending out a message, or is there also some kind of evidence that people actually received and perceived these messages? Uh, and again, is this something that happens or takes place only for the happy few, or is this much more broadly spread? Um, now, these are, of course, very difficult questions to answer, um, especially once you move beyond the kind of uh, aristocracy in, in Rome itself. Um, but I suggest there might be some ways of, of looking at this. Um, so, yeah, possible approaches to, to these questions. Um, the first one is pretty straightforward and has been done by uh, a lot of other people in the past. And that's actually trying or going through the ancient literature and trying to, to find if there are any textual references to coin iconography in the ancient texts, kind of uh, Roman historians or Roman poets kind of referring to coin images. Um, and you might expect that uh, if that is the case, then um, this is something done by an educated elite because it's the elite who writes. So the, the ancient authors are part of the aristocracy usually in Rome or in Italy, not always, but at least they're part of an elite that has had an education that can read and write and, and kind of uh, knows its mythology and, 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 and literature. Um, so that's a, 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 a slice or segment of society you might capture here. Um, another approach, which has also been done occasionally, is actually looking at archaeological evidence. Um, Nathan mentioned one of my foci on coins and context, so investigating coins from archaeological excavations. And 
here we also might find evidence, and I'll have some examples later on, to, that indicate that people were actually paying attention to what was on coins. And the bit of benefit of archaeology is that here we don't uh, grasp just an educated elite, but we can actually get everyone. I mean, excavations are being done across the Roman Empire and everything from the lowliest peasant dwellings until the palaces of the um, of the emperor have been excavated. So we can kind of capture everyone here. Um, and then there is a third source, I would say, and it is actually the coins themselves. We can look at Roman coins as objects and see what has been done to them um, by individuals that somehow indicates that people were looking at these images and, and understanding them or at least perceiving them. And again, I have some examples later on. Um, and then kind of the, 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 the next level, so to say, um, that is to see how or if and how other people, so not, not the Roman imperial authorities themselves, but for example, cities in the Roman East or client kings in, in the East or, in, or even in the Northwest were using or appropriating Roman imperial iconography on their own coins, which implies that they saw the original ones, thought something about them and reused them in their own visual communication, which would again be an, uh, an indication that at least part of the message is being registered and understood and appropriated. Um, so, these, I, I think, or I suggest, are, are possible avenues to explore this topic, and I've taken some examples uh, for all of these. They're, it's not exhaustive, it's just kind of showing what you can, do, what, what can be done with these kind of questions. Um, and, and at the end, I'll, I'll try to kind of draw that all together to get and try to get the first answer to the questions I raised at the start. Um, so starting with textual references or uh, textual evidence, um, there's actually quite a lot. Uh, and I've just taken some examples, um, very famous ones, most of them. Um, for example, here we have a quote from Suetonius, who was a Roman kind of historian who lived in the early second century AD. And he wrote biographies of the emperors up till his own day. Uh, starting with Caesar and uh, ending with Domitian. And he wrote about Augustus, a certain episode where Augustus and his friend Agrippa have just been to consult an astronomer. And this astronomer, or we would call it an astrologist, has prophesied or has, has seen Augustus' birth sign, or has been told his birth sign, and prophesied a, a, a wonderful future for him. Um, and Suetonius then, Suetonian then writes, not long afterwards, Augustus was so confident of the greatness of his destiny that he published his horoscope and struck a silver coin bearing upon it the sign of Capricorn, under the influence of which he was born. And indeed, coins of Augustus showing the Capricorn are quite, well, there are various types, this is one of them. Um, so there are indeed silver coins of Augustus with the Capricorn on them. So Sueton knows about these coins and uses them in his narrative about Augustus. Um, in his biography of Nero, Suetonius again writes about Nero, who, um, and Nero has been to Greece, and in Greece he's toured around the province, and he has participated in games, and of course he's won everything he participated in, he won, of course, um, and then Sueton writes that um, Nero caused statues of himself to be erected in the attire of a harbor and had his likeness stamped upon the coin in the same dress. Um, because part of these games was uh, poetry and, and, and music and Nero won those as well. And according to Sueton, Suetonius, he, uh, he stamped coins with his own image uh, in the attire of a harbor. And indeed, uh, there are coins minted by Nero. Um, and you see one example here where on the obverse is the Emperor Nero, and on the reverse, there is a person playing a harp, let's call it that. Um, whether it really is Nero, or is it Suetonius who thinks this is Nero, is of course something very interesting, and you could discuss this. Is it the case that this really is supposed to represent the Emperor playing the harp, and Suetonius knows about this and uses this in his biography of Nero, um, or is it that Suetonius knew about these coins um, 
or had, had seen them and thought Nero being a very bad emperor, of course, he would have been so kind of proud to actually uh, put his own likeness uh, as a harper uh, on the reverse. So what's kind of what causes what? Is it the coin that actually displays Nero as a harper that leads Suetonius to write about it? Or is it Suetonius seeing a coin of Nero with the harper on it and using that in his narrative about a bad emperor who is so kind of uh, arrogant that he displays himself as a harper on the reverse? But at least these coins were known by Suetonius. Um, and we can go further. Um, Moving away from, from Suetonius to Marshall, uh, a poet who wrote small, well, more smaller or larger poems, uh, living in the time of the Emperor Domitian. Um, and he wrote, or several of his poems also address the Emperor himself. Um, and he also a very famous one. Marshall is, is describing a rare event in Rome, snow. Um, we just discussed snowstorms in New York, but in Rome, snow is a very rare event. Um, and he writes, um, see how thick a fleece of silent congealed water flows down upon the face and the ropes of Caesar, Caesar being the mission. Still he pardons Jupiter for sending it and with head unmoved smiles at the waters condensed by the sluggish cold, being accustomed to brave the constellation of the modern boots and to disregard the great bear drenching his locks. Who can be sporting with the dry waters and gambling in the sky? I suspect this snow came from Caesar's little son. What has Caesar's little son got to do with snow? Well, it's usually thought that this refers to a specific coin minted by Domitian. Uh, on this coin, uh, on the obverse, uh, his empress, and on the reverse, his son. Um, but his son died either at birth or in early infancy. Um, and what this image shows is a, a kind of a deified infant sitting on a globe um, being positioned in the sky, so to say. Hang on, I'll just make here a little pointer. Uh, yeah, so here you can see the little guy sitting on a globe with stars around. And, you know, in a certain way, if you look at it, 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 you can, it, it makes, gives the impression that he's juggling with the stars. And that's supposedly what Marshall is referring to, that he's gambling in the sky, so kind of juggling. Uh, with uh, with the stars and making it snow. Um, so again, uh, um, a passage in a literary text thought to refer to a coin. Um, and a final example, a very clear one, uh, moving on fast forward about 300 years, uh, mid fourth century, um, this is uh, Zosiman, a, a late historian, writing about the emperor, um, Julianus and Julianus was an emperor who reverted away from Christianity and tried to reinstate the, the pagan faith uh, and after his death that was kind of uh, removed again and the emperors returned to Christianity so we're talking about 350s here um, and so Zoman writes um, a scarcity in consequence ensued he's talking about a famine uh, for which the people blamed the emperor and their resentment found vent in ridiculing the length of his beard and the bulls which he had stamped upon his coins. Um, and indeed, um, there are quite numerous coins of the Emperor Julian who, A, wears a beard, a quite long one, quite prominent one, and B, on the reverse, has bulls, uh, which is a very uncommon iconographic topic in this period in time um, and to have on coins. So here again, uh, evidence that at least this, this author was aware that these coins existed and used them uh, in his description of a certain episode in the life of the Emperor Julian. Um, and I could go on with further examples, but I think you get the point. Moving on to a group that's maybe a bit more, on, on, or more complex. Um, that is the archaeological evidence. So how can we tell from archaeological evidence that people were paying attention to coin iconography? Um, one way of going about this is actually looking at coins where we can be sure that they were intentionally deposited. So for example, 
coins in cemeteries, in graves, coins that were given as grave goods or coins that were offered in temples, where we can be sure they're not just lost, they are really selected for a certain ritual purpose. Um, and then we might think about, is there some kind of, in, in the coins selected for a specific purpose, graves, temples, can we see that there is an awareness of the iconography and that the iconography somehow plays a part in the ritual being conducted? Um, and there have been studies on this topic. Um, I just take three examples. There are more, but it has never been really systematically explored. So this really is something that needs a lot more further work. Um, for example, as I said, this is just one example, um, but something that is en encountered more often in burials. Here we see a burial uh, from Roman Switzerland, Avanche, which was a Roman city, a big Roman city uh, in modern Switzerland, um, and a burial. And I think you already can guess that here, the, the, the circular thing with a hole through it lying here is a coin. A coin, and because of the hole in it, we can assume it was worn as an amulet, um, was put deposited, deposited together with uh, the body um, of this infant, it's an infant burial, uh, in the grave. And the image on the coin, so this is not the same coin, but it's the same type, um, because the, the coin itself was quite worn uh, and corroded, but I've, I've taken an example of a, a similar, or the, the same type, um, shows an altar. So an element of architecture that is clearly related to religion, cults, ritual. Um, and the drilling of the hole on the coin was such that if you kind of put, put it on a chain and wear it around your neck, um, it shows the altar the right way up, so to say. So it really was about the altar on the coin and not about the head on the reverse. So someone thought this was an appropriate amulet to give to either a still living child as a kind of protection or then uh, to a deceased child. Um, as somehow connected to, as I said, cult ritual, the afterlife. Um, similar things can be seen in other cemeteries. Here is an example that is kept by the, by the table. Um, another cemetery from Roman Switzerland. The Swiss are just very good at publishing their coins uh, very properly with very well recorded archaeological contexts. That's why I have some examples from Switzerland. Um, and this particular cemetery um, was used for, for a period of time from around 75 AD, that's this period one, up till the early uh, second century, period five. Um, and here you can see the coins that were deposited in the graves belonging to these various periods. And one thing that might immediately strike you is that the coins were quite old. So um, in this kind of Flavian, so late first century period, uh, there are coins deposited in the graves that were at that time about 50, 60, 60 years old. Um, and the reverse types are also kind of interesting. And I just so show some examples. Um, this type that was in the, in the grave previously as well um, is, is frequently on the coins. A thunderbolt is on it quite frequently. And this image of an eagle on a globe, which is an image that at least originally uh, stands for deification. Uh, so an emperor's spirit or soul that's kind of taken up by Jupiter and brought to Olympus. Um, and now the interest, so there are numerous, not, not all coins in, this, in these graves, but a number of them are clearly related to, as I said, cult, religion, deification, um, which are obvious things related to death and burial and, and afterlife. Um, and the thing is, what the excavators did here is they compared the coins in the graves with what was usually in circulation in that particular village at that time. And they found that the, the, the coins in the graves were not just a random sample taken from circulation, but there was a really kind of a, a bias towards these images with clear sepulchral connotations uh, on the coins deposited in the graves. So this is not the coincidence. This is the really deliberate. A further example of such deliberate deposition uh, comes from the UK. Uh, it's from a paper by Nina Crummy on the iconography of protection in late Roman infant burials, published in the Journal of Britannia, 2010. Um, and she looked at a whole row or a whole number of infant burials, all of them fourth century AD. 
And she noticed that in many of these graves, coins are quite common grave goods, uh, but that also the coins are positioned in the graves. They're not randomly thrown in. No, they are placed in the grave with their reverse showing up systematically. So again, this can't be coincidence. If you, if you flip a coin, half the time it lands on the upverse, half the time on the reverse. So if all of them show the reverse up, that means there is a deliberate action taking place. Um, and then she also noticed that frequently um, the images on the coins kind of made sense taken together. She noticed that um, in many graves, on one side of the, of the grave, uh, there were coins showing images that she linked to what she called spiritual protection. So images of, so what well, this is the, the, the symbol of Christ. Um, the other coin you see here is, is two uh, victories uh, showing a, a wreath, but you could also kind of see them as uh, um, a carrying kind of a, a, a wreath of honor to, to someone. Um, so she interpreted this as spiritual, spiritual protection on one side of the grave, whereas on the other side of the grave um, were images which she called physical protection. Um, and I've just enlarged or taken an example of the coins in the grave here. So you see uh, a soldier spearing a horseman, uh, which is obviously a very martial scene. So violence and kind of defending or killing an enemy or defending someone or killing an enemy. Um, and she noticed that it was quite systematic. Um, so on the left hand or on the right hand side of the deceased spiritual protection on the left hand side of the deceased uh, physical protection, and then at the feet, usually a mixture of both. Um, and the way she interpreted this is that um, this could be, I mean, this is going quite far and I'm not sure I completely agree with her, but um, she said, well, you could read this as the, 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 um, the right-hand side being the mother of the deceased child, the spiritual protection and the left-hand side being the father, the physical protection. Um, whether that is, is true is, of course, very difficult to tell, but it shows that there was a selection taking place and that images were not taken or coins were not taken randomly, but that the imagery on them played a role in the ritual of uh, burying, burying um, these children. So that was the kind of the, the second group of evidence, textual evidence, archaeological evidence, again, not exhaustive, but just showing what you can do with these kind of things. Um, the third group is coins themselves. So what, what can coins themselves tell us about whether people actually noticed what was on them and, and paid attention? Um, now this coin is very regular. It's a Cistercius by the Emperor Caligula. You might've heard of him. Um, uh, reigned uh, in the early or the first half of the first century AD. And the thing with Caligula is that um, at least later on, people thought he was quite mad. And after his death, he was, uh, his memory was damned. So uh, people or uh, the Senate and his successor, they, they kind of proclaimed that nothing should remember uh, or should be remembered about this mad emperor, this, this bad, evil, mad emperor. Uh, and his statue should be destroyed. His name should be erased from inscriptions, um, et cetera, et cetera. Now, interestingly, we also find coins where people reacted to this um, damnatio memoriae. Um, here it is quite obvious. Um, it's the same, it's, it's the same coin type, but here the portrait of the emperor and especially uh, has been slashed and you can see also a slash going through his eyes uh, here and one through his hat and then another one going uh, right across it. So someone is trying to eradicate the image of the emperor, which implies to me that this person knows that this is the Emperor Caligula and that somewhere in Rome, someone has said that everything that, that kind of relates to this emperor should be destroyed. Um, and this person has done it. Um, here it's a bit more subtle. Uh, you need to look very closely to actually find what has been done here. Um, here you see the legend as it should read. And here, you see a particular part lacking. Because actually what, what, what's 
the legend says is C, Caesar, Augustus, Germanicus, Pontifex Maximus, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but the crucial thing is C, Caesar, Augustus, Germanicus. C stands for Caius, which is Caligula, uh, Caesar, Augustus, Germanicus, and especially and the C has been eradicated. So because Augustus Germanicus, his, his um, other emperors have similar names, but the, the few letters that actually indicate this is Caligula, they have been erased from this coin. So this is someone who, can't, who not only knows what Caligula or can recognize a coin by Caligula, but it can actually read uh, and eradicates the kind of uh, uh, the sensitive spot, so to say. Um, now you might wonder, is this individuals responding or is this some kind of state sanctioned mechanism? I think I argue this is individuals because coins of Caligula are not rare, not at all. I've seen hundreds of them, maybe even thousands by now looking at coin finds from, from excavations. Um, and this is something that you almost never see. It, it's really um, accidental, well, not accidental, but it's uh, exem exemplary, exceptionally. Um, so it's it's not something that has been systematically done, not at all. This is you know individuals responding to what they know about this emperor and recognizing them and doing something with it. Um, and we have very many, or not very many, but we have similar cases from other emperors who suffered the same fate. For example, um, here we have uh, a denarius from the emperor Vespasian from the year seventy CE. Um, and Vespasian was a good emperor, nothing, nothing wrong with Vespasian, but he had two sons, Titus and Domitian. Uh, he, after Vespasian's death, uh, Titus became emperor. Titus died very shortly afterwards. And then his brother Domitian became emperor. And Domitian, just like Caligula, was an emperor who was hated afterwards. Uh, his, his, for him too, um, his, his memory should be eradicated. And the interesting thing here is that we, as I said, we have a coin of Vespasian, but on the reverse are his two sons, Titus and Domitian. It's, it's a very standard coin type for, for, for Vespasian, proclaiming his successors and his dynasty. Um, so his two sons, Titus is all right, but Domitian is lacking his head. So here too, someone knew about or, or realized this is Domitian. Domitian is a bad emperor. So this happens at least um, 50, was it 25 years after this coin had been issued because um, Domitian died uh, 96 AD. Um, and someone responded to his and eradicated his portrait. Um, or another example, that's the one I also used uh, on the starting slide and that Emma used on the um, <clears throat> Uh, advertising today's talk. Uh, it's a plaster cast of a coin, but the coin in itself also exists, of course, uh, where we see a double portrait, but one portrait is missing. Um, it's a coin struck in the Roman city of Statinikaya in Turkey in the reign of the emperor Caracalla. Uh, and Caracalla once had a brother called Geta, and it's a bit of a similar story to Titus and Domitian. Um, their father was emperor before them, and when he died, he left the empire, so to say, to both his sons, Caracalla and Geta. Uh, but within the year, Caracalla had Geta, well, murdered or so hired someone to murder him. That's a bit unclear who actually did it. But Geta was, was killed, um, and his memory was erased very, very systematically. Uh, ironically, I think he's the emperor remembered best for the er eradication of his memory. Um, uh, and that actually more frequently than either the mission or, or Caligula, uh, his portrait is erased from coins as well. And this is one example, um, but I could show you quite a lot more. So forget that this is something that might be a bit more systematically, maybe a bit more state sanctioned or state induced than for the mission or Caligula. Um, but again, it's not systematically, it's not so that all coins bearing the portrait of Geta have been destroyed or, or erased. <clears throat> it's, it, it remains an exception. Uh, so this is all about obverses. What about the reverses? Well, obverse, I mean, the coin from, from Vespasian is, is, is the reverse, but it refers to a portrait. Um, here too, we have some examples, which we don't know really what to do with, but um, this is a perfectly normal regular coin of the Emperor Augustus. It's one of his most frequent coin types showing on the obverse his own portrait, 
And on the reverse, um, something that is called um, the, the altar of Luc Dunum, uh, which is more, uh, Lyon in modern France. And in this Roman city, Luc Dunum, it was the capital of the Gaulish provinces, there was a big altar for the cult of Roma, so for the goddess Rome and the emperor. That's what it says here, Rom et Auc, Roma et Augustus. So this is a, a, an altar, a temple for the emperor. And it was also the place where once a year, all the representatives of the, of the Gaulish tribes have to, had to come and, and swear allegiance uh, to the Roman emperor. Uh, and now what happens quite often with these coins, and this is just one example, um, is there's this coin type, not other coin types of Augustus, but this coin type, both obverse and reverse are slashed in the way you see here. Um, and I could show many, many more cases where it's not just the obverse, but also the reverse has been slashed. So someone has an issue with what this image stands for and who exactly these people are and why uh, is something we can discuss, but it shows that there is a reaction not only to the image of the emperor, but also to the image of this altar um, on the reverse. Okay, um, I could go on, but I won't. Um, I'm stopping here talking about perception of images. And I think that, or I hope I have shown you that the, the textual sources, but also the archeological and the mismatic sources that they show that especially the portrait, the imperial portrait is perceived and recognized for the emperor it actually displays and is associated with imperial power on a more general level, but also with the emperor as an individual. Not systematically, not everywhere, but we de do see occasions where you know, people are really responding to the image of this particular emperor or the emperor in general. And that reverse images, and it was particularly the case for the depositions in, in graves are perceived as well, but on a more generic level. So they're, um, it's, it's a kind of, association with cults or with death and burial or with rituals, but not specifically with what was on or what, what Roman authorities meant with that reverse, particular reverse image. The exception might be the educated elite. This what are the, the textual references where they're talking about, you know, Caesar's son uh, juggling with the stars or the, the bull on the, on the coins of Julian um, or, or Nero as a harper. Uh, that shows that at least some people were also paying attention to the reverses and understanding what these reverses were trying to convey. Um, so keep that in mind and we move on to in how far are images and kind of actually understood and reworked in different coinages. Um, coins from the provinces is one thing to start with. And as many of you will know, um, coins were minted in Rome, but coins were also minted in very many cities in the Greek East. And this is a map of the mints at some point active in the Greek East in the Roman Imperial period. Uh, so that's uh, up to hundreds of cities minting coins at some point. And the interesting thing about these coins, um, or many interesting things about these coins, um, is to see how they change through time. And what I mean by that is that Many of these cities also minted coins uh, during the Roman Republic, so a time before Rome had its emperors. And many of, not all, but many of these cities were already part of a Roman Empire uh, or the so-called Republican Empire. Um, and in this period, these coins hardly refer to Rome. They keep on minting what they had been doing before they were part of the Roman Empire uh, or might make some changes, but they're not really referring to the fact that they are now part of the Roman Empire. That changes under the Emperor Augustus. From the reign of Augustus onwards, the civic coins, so the coins minted in the cities of the Roman East, start displaying the imperial portrait as well. So it's not just the coins in Rome that now have the image of an emperor on them, uh, because it's now an empire with an emperor, a monarch, but it's also the, ci the cities in the East are responding to this and doing the same. And this is not a top-down measure because it doesn't start everywhere at the same moment. It, it varies. Some of them start very early, you know, kind of almost immediately after Augustus becomes the sole monarch. Um, Others do it much later, like 20, 30 years later, but by the end of the reign of Augustus, it's, it's omnipresent, it's everywhere. Um, 
you might get the impression um, that what this, especially in the early period, so in, in like the first half of the first century AD, what these cities <clears throat> try to convey is that there is, there is an emperor, not necessarily which emperor, um, because what they quite often have that also the successes of Augustus are put on coins, but they're not named, they're just labeled as here, Sebastos, which is Greek for the emperor. Uh, so it's not really relevant which emperor, it is the emperor, and he's in Rome and he's important, but which one is for now not really relevant. Um, so it's a bit different from what's going on in Rome, but at least it, it shows that they know that in Rome, coins now have the emperor on them, um, and the cities, one by one, start doing the same thing. But it's not only the obverse that's changing. Interestingly, it's also the reverse. Um, you might know that in the Roman Republican period, um, Roman coins are, are different from Greek coins in that sense that they often display architecture on coins. It's some, a very Roman thing to do, to put a, an image of a temple or an aqueduct or um, uh, something you, you've built or something that has been built, the built environment, to put that on coins. It's a very Roman thing. It doesn't really happen on Greek coinages. Um, and in the Republican period, when all these cities are already, or some of these cities are already part of the Roman Empire, they're not doing this either. But then again, from the reign of Augustus, slowly, this idea of putting architecture on coins is taken up in the provinces. Um, and this is just an example of about temples. So uh, Andrew Burnett made a survey of that. Uh, and just you know, kind of tabulating how many cities actually put a temple on their coins starting in the reign of Augustus. Uh, and you can see that you know, it, it, it varies a bit, but there is a slowly increasing number of cities that takes on this theme of, oh, we can, we can actually put architecture on coins. The Romans do it, we do it as well. Um, this is just one example of how, what, what these things look like. I mean, um, it's not a Roman temple. It's, it's a temple in their own city they put on these coins. So it's something referring to their local identity. But the whole concept of displaying architecture on coins is something that is not a local thing to do. It's something that comes from Rome and is being taken up uh, in these cities. So this is kind of a, a generic thing. The, 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 um, the concept of the portrait of the emperor, the concept of architecture, putting that on your own coins, because someone, we talk about that a bit later, has seen this on Roman coins and thinks this is a good idea for the coins of my, my own hometown. Um, sometimes it goes a bit further and it's actually quite a close copy of what is being displayed on Roman imperial coins to then what, what then occurs on provincial coins. Um, this is one example. Um, this is a Sestertius struck for the Emperor Trajan, which is quite, well, in, well, interesting, quite unique in the way it renders an aqueduct. Um, so it, this, is, this coin is, is struck to, to commemorate that uh, Trajan built an aqueduct, the Aqua Traiana. Um, and here you see the personification of a river god who is kind of depicted in a kind of grotto um, which stands as a kind of symbol for this particular uh, aqueduct. And now this way of rendering a river god in a grotto is then echoed in coinages in the provinces. This is an example almost 100 or well, more than 100 years later, somewhere in Phrygia, which is in Turkey, um, where one get, very strongly gets the impression that the one, the person who made this, the die for this coin, knew about this coin and thought this was a very clever way of trying to uh, render an image of a river god uh, in his grotto. Um, and sometimes it becomes even closer. Um, and that's with this particular coinage series. Um, this is a, a, a coinage series, and this is just one example uh, on a Sestertius, but it's it's present on on, on gold, on silver, uh, on all bronze denominations. Um, it's it, th these are coins from early on in the reign of the Emperor Marcus Aurelius. What happened there, as many of you will know, but I'll just explain it for those of you who don't, um, is that there was an innovation at the start of his reign because he wasn't emperor all by himself. He had a colleague. Um, his uh, uh, predecessor, uh, Antoninus Pius, had designated two 
persons to, to man to inherit or to, to succeed him. Um, Marcus Aurelius and Lucius Verus. Um, so there were co-emperors, joint emperors to Augusti at the same time. And later on, this became standard in the Roman Empire. But here, this is an innovation. Uh, and this new concept of, of, of rulership was communicated on coins very systematically. Uh, in the way you see here, two, well, these are Marcus Aurelius and Lucius Verus shaking hands uh, and thereby demonstrating um, um, their, their harmony. And uh, the legend says Concordia Augustorum, so the harmony of the emperors, uh, uh, showing, you know, kind of communicating in writing what the image already is, is expressing. And now this particular image then pops up in numerous coinages in the provinces. This is an example uh, from a city in Kilikia, again, Turkey, um, where you can clearly see the same concept being taken over uh, on these coin from the reign of Marcus Aurelius and even kind of a translation of the Latin. It's not Concordia, but it's Homonia, which is the same thing, but in Greek. Um, and other cities do the same, but add a kind of a local flavor. Uh, here is a city from Magnesia or a coin from Magnesia on the Meander, uh, a city in, uh, again in Turkey. On the obverse, Marcus Aurelius, and on the reverse, Marcus Aurelius and Lucius Verus, and the local city god, just to kind of uh, combine this with a local, as I said, uh, flavor. So again, ju just some examples, but what we can see is that the iconography of Roman imperial coinages is incorporated into the visual world of coinages in the Roman East, starting from the reign of Augustus. So this is a visual communication on a local level. Um, but that means, or at least um, I think this means that the people making the dyes or commissioning the images or the coins in these cities had experience of or had knowledge of imperial coins. Otherwise you can't copy these images or, or either the concept of a portrait, a temple or built environment or very specific to emperor shaking hands. You need to know what's going on in the imperial mint uh, to actually produce this. Um, how did that work? Because many of the coins of the, of the imperial coins I showed you were not circulating in the East. Some of them did, but not all of them, especially not the bronze coins or hardly circulating. Now people have thought about this and they come up with explanations that it's kind of distinguished individuals who are traveling or ambassadors of cities who are in Rome and you know kind of notice Roman coins and bring this idea back home and say this is a good idea we put a temple on our coin as well. Um, this is it, it, it's not very tangible who, who might these persons be and I, I don't really have an answer but I think it has well it may be a, a catch-all phrase, but it has something to do with networks, networks of local elites stretching all the way to Rome and somehow being aware of or being sensitized to what's going on in the coinage there and using it for their own uh, civic uh, coin issues. Uh, but again, evidence that people are realizing, seeing, perceiving what's happening uh, iconograph iconographically wise uh, on imperial coins and using that on their own. Uh, media. It's not just, and that's my final example, it's not just um, civic or cities in, in the Roman East that, that do this kind of thing. Also on the fringes of the Roman world, we can see this happening. And that's what the so-called client kings are doing. Client kings are, well, it's a bit difficult to explain, but they're, at least theoretically, these are independent small kingdoms at the borders of the Roman world at least and but Rome has kind of um, treaties with them um, saying okay we support you uh, when you support us so you don't attack us and we support you or uh, we, we give you some money um, so theoretically they're independent but in practice they're very str uh, strongly controlled uh, by Rome and most of these client kingdoms at some point become part of the Roman Empire anyway um, Client kingdoms, it's something that, uh, it, it also occurs later on, but it's, it's particularly prominent in the early empire. So under the Emperor Augustus, there, is a, a, there are a number of client kingdoms and the phenomenon kind of peters out towards uh, the end of the first century AD. Um, and it's very interesting to see that 
Images on the coinages of Augustus are echoed in the coins of the client kings. And here are two of the most frequently echoed images. Um, two coins of Augustus, the one on the right hand side you've already seen when I mentioned uh, Augustus a star sign and his visit to an astronomer. So it's his, 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 um, his birth sign, the Capricorn. Uh, the other one uh, on your left hand side is a coin of Augustus displaying on the reverse the comet that was seen um, when his uh, adopted father, Julius Caesar, died. Uh, according to legend, when Julius Caesar died, his, uh, the, a, a comet was seen in the sky, the so-called Cedum Julius, or uh, Cedus Julium, um, so the, the, the Julian star, um, and that was taken as a sign that his spirit, his ghost, had been received on Olympus. Um, and here on the coin, you actually see a rendering of a comet. Um, this, this thing over here is, is supposed to be kind of a, a, a um, the, 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 what's it, the, the tail of a comet. Um, that's, uh, uh, you can see flaring through, through the sky, so to say. Now, looking at some coins of client kings, these are coins issued by someone called Tinkomaris. You probably haven't heard of him. Um, a British client king um, in, in, in the UK, so, so in England, minting coins around the same time as the coinages of Augustus himself, curiously displaying a similar star on the reverse. And if this just happened once, it might just be a freak coincidence. Um, but another British client king, a, a guy called Apelles, actually has a Capricorn on his coins. And now both these images are absolutely alien to local Celtic coinages at that time in Britain. Um, so, and there are more examples. These client kings are clearly inspired um, by the images they see on the coins of Augustus. Now, how might that work? And for the sake of time, I'll just skip these. Um, Someone, I'm, I'm not the first one to notice this. Um, it's, it's a paper by John Creighton who first drew attention to this. And he realized going through both coinages of client kings and literary sources that many of these client kings, um, it was a kind of a, a structure or a concept the Romans did almost always, is that when they signed or they had a treaty with a client kingdom, they wanted a guarantee that this client king would indeed cooperate with Rome. And uh, as, a, as a surety for this, this treaty, they usually asked, or well asked, <laughs> commanded the sons of the client king to be brought to Rome and be raised there and to be kept, to be kept there as hostages in the case the, the father didn't behave very well. Um, but these client, so the sons of client kings were at court in Rome as hostages. Um, and Creighton explains the appearance of Augustan iconography on the coins of client kings, and not just the British ones, also ones from Austria and from Judea and North Africa, um, as that these sons were kind of at court, they were imbued with the visual communication or the physical political messages of Augustus and took them home once they were released and succeeded their fathers. So, Roman coin iconography is not only perceived and appropriated in the provinces, uh, but also on the fringes of the Roman world. And again, I could give more examples, but this is just to show you some avenues to further explore. Um, now bring all this together. Um, at the beginning, I asked, well, do we have any evidence of interacting with iconography? And is this really at all levels of society? Um, and I think that we, if we differentiate between like three big rather generic groups, we have an educated aristocracy mainly based in Rome who can read and write um, and are part of kind of the inner circle of the Roman world. Then we have important persons on a local level, the local elites in East and West, so these client kings, but also the kind of the city magistrates in the cities in the, in, in, in the Roman East. And then we have the big group, the rest. Um, and I can think that, or I think, or I have hoped to, to have shown you today that um, there is, especially in the literary sources, quite a lot of evidence that at least this educated aristocracy 
perceived and appreciated the repertoire of images on coins um, and also used them, um, especially we, we saw the example of Suetonius, but they, they used these images and how they interpreted these images in their, in their own narratives about the emperors and the concept of empire. So whether they really understood the message, well, I think they understood the messages, but the way they conveyed the message on coins might not be what the emperor initially intended, but these, especially these ancient authors, used the imagery uh, in their own narrative. Now, the local elites in East and West, we, we saw that in the Republic, this is not happening, but starting with Augustus, um, we see increasingly that elements of Roman imperial iconography are adopted, but also not, not slavish copies, also adapted to fit into kind of the local visual world to integrate these Roman or Roman ways or Roman messages in the local modes of visual communication. And thereby these local elites are integrating themselves in these Roman networks and Roman practices of power. At least that's what, how, I would, um, how I would see this. And then the big group, the rest is much more difficult, of course, but even there, I can think that the archeological evidence, but also the, the coins themselves, where we see these slashes on, on, on the portrait or on the altar of Augustus, uh, they show that at least people take notice of coin iconography. They might not catch the subtleties that might be intended. Uh, I think they interpret them as a past proto of imperial power at large, the emperor, the empire. Um, and that the reverse images are underst understood on a, also on a quite generic level, cults, gods, that, that, that way of thinking. Um, but that these images do play a role in structuring daily life in a symbolic way, because these coins are integrated in cult practices, showing that they, 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 strike, a, they strike a nerve and people interact with them. Um, well, I'm, I'm uh, curious to see whether I've convinced you of how you can look at coinages and various kinds of sources and how people interact with iconography. Um, and I'm very happy to discuss questions, comments, ideas. Maybe you don't agree. I would also like to hear that. Um, so please, Emma, Nathan, whoever. Uh, Nathan, <laughs> Yeah. Or, or Peter. Nathan had to leave a little bit early and he apologizes yeah. for um, having to take off. So I'm happy to, to moderate questions. Um, thank you for this absolutely wonderful and fascinating uh, discussion of all of this. And as somebody who currently sits on uh, the Citizens Coinage Advisory Committee with the US Mint, where we discuss coin iconography and how this will interact with the public and the reception um, it, it really is a fascinating topic to, um, you know, be looking at it from this end, trying to understand the process, uh, you know, from uh, this, this perspective, and also then sitting on this committee where we are actively discussing, you know, exactly how, you know, that sort of problem of reception and problems of iconography and, and so forth, uh, you know, are, you know, today. So really, really quite fascinating. Uh, do do we have any questions? Uh, let me just check the chat here. Um, uh, uh, well, Daniel Wolf is saying per persuasively argued. Thank you. So, um, Drew is asking, would countermarks add to the evidence? Um, yes and no. I I, I think. <laughs> um, I think countermarks are not are something not done by individuals, but are somehow part of, of state level measures um, or state maybe local local um, uh, what, what's the word uh, uh, local governments, uh, but not individuals. So we we might through through counter. I mean, there there's particular countermarks that go right through the portrait of an emperor, stating the name of the new emperor, for example. Um, and that is an indication that they know this is a coin of the old emperor, and now we have, with the countermark, made it a coin of the new emperor. Um, so yes, that, that is evidence of perception of iconography, um, but I think that, that this countermarking takes place, as I said, at some kind of government level, either all the way up or somewhere local, um, which is not surprising if, if coins come through the coffers of the text 
collector or something and then being distributed again, then it's quite easy to select the ones that, that you need and, and countermark them. Um, yeah. Good. Um, any other questions? Yeah, I, I, I have a question. First, um, uh, I want to go ahead, Don. Again, uh, uh, again compliment uh, a very interesting talk. I'm wondering whether there's any evidence from the earlier empire uh, of um, the users of coins preferring to use coins minted with the portrait of the current emperor rather than um, uh, the emperor's predecessors. I, I believe in the Theodosian code, or at least in, in, in later Roman law, they had to pass laws saying that gold coins of proper weight with uh, the portrait of earlier emperors were legal money and, and should be accepted for commercial transactions. Is there any evidence like that in the earlier empire? Um, uh, yes, thank you. <clears throat> Sorry. I think it's actually um, the, the, the law you're referring to, I think it's actually, it is from the Theodosian Code, but is, isn't it referring to uh, a much earlier, I think it's, it relates to the Emperor Hadrian, if I remember correctly, that oh, uh, um, uh, that there is some, some dispute that people don't want to accept bad coins of bad emperors, and it said, no, no, the portrait, no, yeah, so if it's, if it's a coin with a portrait of an emperor on it, you should accept it regardless of which emperor it is. Uh, I think that actually refers to the early empire. Um, yeah. Thank you. Very good. Any other questions? Silence. Well, um, Flora, again, uh, I'd like to thank you for an absolutely wonderful presentation on uh, this Friday afternoon. And I know that it's getting a little late where you are in Frankfurt. I'm getting hungry. <laughs> yeah, I would imagine it's, it's about time for, uh, for dinner where you are. We're just finished with lunch here in New York. Um, happy to, uh, to let you go to uh, have your, uh, your dinner and would like to thank you again uh, for this wonderful presentation. Um, You're welcome. And, uh, it was a pleasure. Uh, Emma, Thank you for watching the American Numismatic Society's YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you like our online resources, publication, and events, you can support the Society by becoming a member. And don't forget to check out our book and eBay stores. The links are below.